From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, a very good morning. I'm Manish Cranny, in for Jonathan Farrow. These equity markets seem to just lean into the old GDP data rather than the warning from Waller to wait. And a small spike in yields. We'll debate over the next hour. Come down to the open. It kicks in right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. show markets digest more fed speak push back on rate expectations stocks on the cusp of closing out a blockbuster first quarter and traders look ahead to the pce the data and chair pal we begin with the big issue waller pouring cold water on the path to lower rates in my view it is appropriate to reduce the overall number of rate cuts or push them further into the future in response to the recent data i see no rush in taking the step of beginning to ease monetary policy. Mike McKee is with me side by side. So did, uh, did Waller pour cold water on Powell's dovishness? Mike, your take. Well, he certainly seemed to, at least in the market's view. You take a look at what's happened with the Fed Fund's futures pricing for rate cuts. And we had moved to sort of a tie between June and July. And now July is almost priced out which would put the first move in September if it happened. You can see the Waller effect. That's the jump condition we see in Fed Funds futures for July this morning. So he hid had a major impact on market thinking last night. Now, here's his reasoning behind it all. If you look at payrolls, they've been very strong. 2023 payrolls averaged 263. For the past three months, it's been 265. They've gotten stronger. Core CPI running at a 3.3% annual rate in the last three months of the year and in December, and now running at 4.2%. GDP, 2.5% uh, for 2000. 2023, sorry, uh, and then 2.1% is where we are right now. The forecast 2.2% is still stronger than the Fed's view of neutral, and he's skeptical of ongoing productivity gains that would raise the uh, ability of the economy to grow without uh, inflation. Now, here's what he said about this whole thing. Uh, the overall strength of the U.S. economy makes it a fairly easy decision to wait a little longer to get a better understanding of the trajectory of inflation and, when appropriate, begin easing policy. So at this point, uh, you got to look to tomorrow and the PCE inflation numbers and, of course, Jay Powell will see what he thinks. I did want to throw this in, this inflation number, just before Easter here. We've been talking a lot about the cost of cocoa rising. You can see the blue line there. It has jumped significantly. But the white line is candy uh, overall. And it's not moved at all. Uh, it, it's still very low. So obviously, uh, the lesson for, from inflation for this weekend is buy non-chocolate Easter candy. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'll, I'll bear that in mind when I'm looking for the Easter eggs. Michael, thank you very much. Mike McKee. Uh, and, of course, you can catch Mike tomorrow morning uh, on Bloomberg Radio, breaking down the PCE numbers. Let's continue the conversation now with Crossmark's Victoria Fernandez and Krishna Mamani of Lafayette College. Victoria Fernandez uh, writes this. This is what we have uh, in terms of the view. Historically, we see inflation moving in waves. Perhaps we are nearing a second wave after a period of disinflation that still hasn't gotten us back to the Fed's preferred level. And herein lies the conundrum that Waller really leans in on, isn't it? The risk is this. Wait and see. We've got the data on our side. We can afford to wait. Good morning, Victoria. Good morning. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Um, Waller, I think, is expressing what a lot of investors are saying is, look, we haven't seen a clear-cut downtrend um, from this more three, three and a half percent level of inflation. There was a quick move from the higher levels to where we are now, but now it's starting to look a little bit sticky. Kind of that last mile of inflation is going to be a little bit more difficult. So what is the rush in bringing rates down? And I think you have to look at the fact that in the last meeting, we had the summary of economic projections moving inflation expectations higher, moving growth higher, 
keeping the rate cuts at three, I know only by one vote, but keeping it there. So I think you also have to ask the question, how restrictive are rates where they are at this current level? Are they truly restrictive enough to get us down to 2%? I know the Fed doesn't want to raise rates from here. They've pretty much said mm -hmm. they're at the top of the limit. Um, but I think you have to be careful on the, the timing that the market expects on rates to come down. Yeah, well, they are pushing, they are now pushing a little bit further forward from June into July. Krishna, good morning. The one word which we've not spent any time on was Waller did use the word restrictive. Rates are restrictive, which I find interesting because they're obviously not restrictive enough to really slow growth. Look at the backward looking data on GDP, I know this morning, but it was a nuance. He did use the word restrictive. So what does that imply to you? So I, I think Waller is a very credible uh, macroeconomist. And I think if you look a little bit at the nuance, I, I think it tells you a little different story than what Victoria was talking about, which is the, the fact of the matter is, if somebody like Waller is looking at month-to-month -month inflation and growth data to make a cutting decision, he's telling you that he wants to cut. It's just that the data is not supporting him. And, and I think that's the same story that uh, Jay Powell said. I, I think we can debate whether marking up growth and marking up inflation and getting three cuts or keeping three cuts was the right thing to do or not. But at the end of the day, what the Fed is telling you is that they believe, truly they believe, that rates are restrictive. We can debate whether that is having an impact or not. Sure. But in their judgment, that is a fact. And if that is the case, I think they will cut. Data dependent for sure, but they will cut and they certainly won't raise. And for the markets, uh, at the end of the day, that's what we are trying to analyze. For the markets, it doesn't really matter that much. What matters is rate volatility is relatively low. It's likely to remain relatively low. And as long as the case, we do fine. With that rate volatility remains low, Krishna, and if we are at this juncture, not immune from whether it's three cuts or two cuts, but we're not stressed about it, what does that mean for the rates market? Because short pop on the very short end, people are now beginning to talk about steepeners again, aren't they? Well, they are going to talk about steepeners, but at the same time, given what they have indicated, which is even Waller yesterday basically said that they want to cut. They just want to wait before cutting. So if that is the outlook, I, I don't think that means the steepeners are going to be as fierce and as uh, as substantial as we might, uh, we might fear. Uh, Victoria, we've had a pretty strong, I think would be the superlative, and that's understated in a quarter, up 10%. Uh, the Mag7 has had a, a phenomenal run, bar Apple and Tesla. John Arthurs this morning says, global stocks are at a record. The spoos are up 10%. The burrs have capitulated. I mean, there's the Mag7. We can uh, digest the bifurcation there in, in just a moment. But do you think the burrs have capitulated in this equity market? I think I would say the bears have moved from being in that recession camp to being more in a cautious camp. We're actually a little bit cautious as well. We know there's this strong momentum um, in the equity markets, a lot of that driven by the MAG-7, the, the stocks that you're talking about. Um, and you look and you say, OK, wait, we're about 100 days now of the S&P trading above its 50-day moving average. We actually saw advancers versus decliners yesterday, six to one. So so there is some breadth um, that is being supportive of the momentum trade. And we're seeing some change in some leadership. So that's all supportive of momentum. But I think the bears are saying, hold on, there's also some elements that should cause us a little bit of concern. Some of the um, items that have been tailwinds or been supportive of this momentum, like the Fed cutting sooner and more than what uh, many people thought they would, um, the consumer, those tailwinds, I think, are going to start to pull back a little bit, which would tell us we need to be a little cautious in our positioning in the market, but you still want to be invested in the market and take advantage of the momentum trade, especially in the short to intermediate term. Krishna, when I look at the writings of the chief equity analyst over at JP Morgan, Lekos Bujo says, look, a lot of the goodies are already in the market, but he makes the point that crowded trades, in other words, those huge fat tails that we have at the moment, we know where they are. They're in the MAG7, they're in the high, they're in the high beta uh, chip and, and, and technology sector. But he warns that 
you can have one faltering move that causes the dominoes to fall over. And he does warn that this crowding, this momentum that you have in crowding could falter, and that could have a much bigger ramification than we presume. Well, I, I think to some extent it is true, but uh, to, uh, to some extent it is always true. That is, we can always have something that will take us down. But at the end of the day, what matters for stocks, which are nominal instruments, is really nominal growth and earnings growth. That, that matters a great deal more than anything else. And both of those point to a, a higher level. I think uh, Victoria's point is a good one, which is valuations are, in certain sectors, somewhat stressed. And therefore, expecting those sectors to continue to perform is probably not the right approach, or at least... Uh, you know, they may not go up as, much as, up as much as we think. But at the same time, there are lots of other sectors in the market that have started performing. And I think the, the broadening of, uh, is, yeah. of, of the rally certainly helps. And I think the fact that small caps and mid caps are reacting certainly points in the right direction. So I, I think the upside is not substantial, but arguing for a significant downside, it doesn't jive with the data at the moment. OK, and Victoria, we've just had the CEO of Merck on talking about, you know, the FDA approval from yesterday. And those are those are individual movers within healthcare. But as a slightly more defensive position, you favor health and energy. Just looking at oil prices up 14 percent on the quarter, the OPEC plus uh, cuts are working. Energy is strong. The demand is there. Are they your buffers to sort of, let's say, faltering a falter in momentum? Yeah, I think so. And I mean, you look at healthcare, as you mentioned, there's a, a handful that have done really well from the GLP-1 news. Merck was doing well from the announcements yesterday. Um, but healthcare in general, even looking at your HMOs, they are doing well. I think you can put some money to work in some of those sectors. And energy, even though they've done really well year to date, I think there's still some upside potential there as we talk about changes in leadership, look at energy. This week alone, you had about 80% of the constituents in the energy sector um, achieve three-month highs. So we are seeing that rotation out of tech into other areas. And we think in the second half of the year, it's these sectors, it's healthcare, it's energy, even financials. We think you'll see their earnings. Krishna talked about how important earnings are. We'll see the earnings of these areas start to catch up with what we've seen in other parts of the market as they slow down. So this is a good entry point, especially on a down day. You can go in and pick up some of these names to give a little bit of buffer to your portfolio. Okay. Well, we all need that and top and tail of the week. You're the second person to say that financials could be in there with Stock Gen at the start of the week. Victoria, thank you so much. Victoria Fernandez uh, and Krishna uh, Mamani, my guests this morning on the markets. Joining me now on set is Simone Foxman, taking you through the movers ahead of that opening bell. Good morning, Simone. Yeah, good morning, Manus. To Victoria's point, grappling with earnings this morning, traders grappling with the earnings from Walgreens, which narrowed its 2024 guidance. Uh, excuse me, we're looking at Home Depot here, but I want to point to Walgreens because those results came out this morning down shares there are down 2% uh, after it beat estimates for the quarter through the end of February, but booked a steep net loss on the val on after writing down the value of its Village MD primary health care unit. Also looking at Reddit, adding to losses that it saw yesterday, lost 11% yesterday after Hedgeye Risk Management said it was a short target, um, predicts its value was fall by about 50%, and that the company would see rapid deceleration in user and revenue growth in the second half and in the first half of 2025. Finally, we are watching uh, the high-end furniture retailer RH. It had a big miss on fourth quarter earnings, but it said guidance for revenue growth for the 2024 year would be up 8 to 10 percent. Bloomberg Intelligence says that's aggressive, uh, but clearly the market's enthused uh, by that forecast, Manus. Simone, thank you very much. Coming up, UBS cuts its bonus pool by 14% for 2023. Meanwhile, it raises the pay of the CEO. He is now the best paid European bank boss. That is Sergio Motti. That conversation on Blue. into the world of finance now a little bit more. UBS reporting record annual profit. 
Driven by the company's acquisition of Credit Suisse, the bank also is cutting its bonus pool by 14% despite raising the pay of the CEO, Sergio Motti. The raise makes him the top paid banker in Europe. But yet, take a look at that, still seriously lagging his peers in the United States of America. Jamie Dimon on 36 million. And Noel Quinn, his remuneration, of course, doubling to $13 million, still behind Sergio. Michael Moore is with us on this story. Um, it was a pretty important deal, UBS, Credit Suisse, mm -hmm. two systemic banks. Um, but Armati is the top, he's the king pin right. in Europe right. in pay, but there's still that differential with the US, isn't there? Yeah, there's still a huge gap with, uh, you know, not just Jamie Dimon, but all the U.S. banks. You know, a lot of that is driven by the profitability gap, uh, you know, the price to book uh, gap there. But UBS has made some progress on that front, and I think that's why you're seeing uh, the pay bump there. But I, I think it does fit into the trend we've seen, that, which is for the staff, you know, pay was not great uh, last year in 2023. But for a lot of the executives, they saw a nice bump. So this is in part about retention, and it's about yep. keeping the ship steady, although cutting the pool by 14%. They're not alone in doing that. I yes. mean, a number of other houses did cut uh, across Europe as well. Talk to me this morning. We have a, a letter from Colin Callagher. It mm -hmm. talks about, uh, talking about steadying the ship, it talks about the duration that Sergio Motti could be at the helm and some interesting points that Colin Callagher makes. Yeah, they said, you know, at least for the integration, perhaps longer, you know, and they've talked about the integration being five years. You know, that's notable because Armadi turned 64 in a few weeks. And uh, so, you know, they're kind of laying out a timeline for him uh, being there into his late 60s. But uh, I think we kind of expected that when they brought him back, you know, um, for round two. Um, and they had uh, signaled that this would not be an easy or a quick integration. Uh, so they want someone who's going to be steady throughout that period uh, that's going to bring a lot of changes and a lot of job cuts. I, there's a wonderful line in the story, which is Sergio's, you know, he, uh, <laughs> he, he, he looks a lot younger perhaps than actually he <laughs> is at 64. Um, but, but this is about putting these two units together, Credit Suisse and, and UBS. Do we have any sense of, they've often said this year is a critical year. Why is this year so critical for this integration, Michael? Well, I think last year was about getting it started, and this year is about some of the difficult work. You know, Credit Suisse came in with a lot of legacy issues, you know, on the legal side, on, uh, you know, on integrating the, these two businesses. There was a lot of overlap. Uh, so I think uh, this is, you know, last year you had the huge uh, initial gain from the purchase. That was the uh, negative goodwill aspect. Yes, of yes, and that, you know, kind of, you know, covered a lot of, of sins, as it were. But uh, this yep. year is about kind of digging into what is this business going to look like going forward. OK, Michael, thank you very much. That's the very latest from Wall Street. Michael Moore there on the UBS story. Let's switch gears to politics. The Treasury Secretary Yellen slamming China's use of subsidies to gain an unfair competitive advantage, saying this. There is no country in the world that subsidizes its preferred or priority industries as heavily as China does. Amri Hordern is with me now. So, I mean, we saw Xi meeting some pretty impressive lineup of U.S. industry leaders yesterday. Why is Yellen taking aim at the subsidies? One could argue a number of the chips companies here have had a few subsidies thrown at them. See you and raise you. Anne-Marie, good morning. Right. Well, one issue, of course, is that we had this complaint filed at the WTO about the Inflation Reduction Act from the Biden administration on China when it comes to electric vehicles and the subsidies you can get if parts, most parts of those electric vehicles are not being subsidized from places like China. So this is potentially her hitting back on that recent WTO complaint. Also, it is reported that she is expected to travel to China for the second time as Treasury Secretary in the coming weeks in early April. And she said, I will press my Chinese counterparts on this. And when she's talking about is overcapacity in these green energy space and China and she talked about China's global domination desire in these industries speaking to MSNBC yesterday and then also is talking from a solar factory in Georgia. She also compared in her speech what we saw in terms of overcapacity what she sees from China now that they had in the steel and aluminum uh, previously in those kinds of investments and she says this distorts global supply chains and also Manus it's an election year it also distorts what's happening in terms of labor markets. They want to make sure that jobs for these types of industries stays in the United States. And then this plays 
back to we are in full drum electioneering mode. And these kind of stories and narratives will play well. They will play well because both Trump and Biden want to talk tough on China. But what we've seen is that Trump had these tariffs on China. The Biden administration kept the Trump era tariffs in place and then upped the notch in terms of export controls. So going to an election season, you're going to want to see, uh, you're going to see, but one thing that's very has bipartisanship in Washington, D.C., is yep. going to be taking the hammer when it comes to China. And there's a slow slowdown of foreign direct investment to China. To your point, when we started this segment, probably why Xi Jinping wanted to make sure he met with American executives. Yeah, well, it was a, a grand piece of theater yesterday, wasn't it? Amri, thank you very much. Amri Hordern, uh, tracking the political narrative. Coming up on the show, your morning calls a little bit later. Uh, joining me on set, it is Mohammed al Adri uh, of InvestCorp on his outlook for private credit markets. This is Bimba. green trade for the moment as we go to the end of this first quarter with a five-month rally in play. Nasdaq holding up 18,500. Let me get you up to speed with your morning calls from Wall Street. This is what the scribes have penned this Thursday. First up, Bank of America upgrades Estee Lauder to a buy, saying the earnings have bottomed and that they expect the market share to grow for Estee as it reduces its reliance on China. Next up, DZ Bank downgrades Apple to a hold lowering the price target on the stock. Analysts see regulatory issues as a risk for Apple. The DOJ accused it of violating antitrust laws. And finally, HSBC downgrades Bank of America to hold, saying the recent stock rally leaves little upside potential. Coming up, we speak to Mohammed al Adri on the outlook for infrastructure investing here in the United States of America. His view of assets in the alternative world right here on Bloomberg. hero before the PC? Do you really want to be that person that takes a huge risk position before the inflation data? Waller made it very clear, pouring cold water on the necessity to move. Uh, you're still trading up for five months in a row. We haven't seen a day of where this market has dropped by more than 2%. This is a quite a furious rally. We're rolling over to the open. We're still above 5,300. Uh, one stock that we are keeping an eye on, it is Estee Lauder the personal car company. Some other uh, assets to keep an eye on. You've got two-year yields. They popped by seven basis points yesterday evening as Waller poured cold water on the necessity to move now, immediately. Uh, in terms of rate cuts, you're also looking at euro dollar up by, uh, down by an eighth of 1% at the moment. You're looking at a five-week low as we saw the dollar go bid on the back of the Waller comments. And crude is flying higher, up 1.38%, up 14% on the quarter. Uh, and again, the OPEC Plus cuts are biting hard into the supply side. And Saudi manages to raise the price of their crude to Asia by 10 cents for May. Those are the markets. One stock, I was ahead of myself there. That's never a bad thing. Estee Lauder, it is the personal care company. They were upgraded by Bank of America to a buy from neutral, saying that the earnings have bottomed. Simone Foxman 
has the details. Simone. Yeah, the bank also raising its price target to $170 a share from $160 a share. Shares uh, up 3.5% in today's trading. The bank saying that the negative revisions that it has seen over the past two years are both the fault of the company and the macro environment. But now the measures are in place that, that, that are needed to sharpen the brand. A better balance across geographies and regions, reducing reliance on China and travel retail all of this going to lead to a profit recovery. I should note, however, this is enthusiasm carrying over from yesterday after the company announcing that its Clinique line would be available in the U.S. Amazon premium beauty store. Canaccord says that's going to make it easier for customers to get Clinique. Even Jefferies, which has a hold on the stock, says that they are excited about this distribution channel. Uh, shares, I should mention, are about 60 percent below their December 2021 peak, though. Is this the beginning of the turnaround uh, traders today uh, grappling with that question Manis. okay so thank you very much let's turn our attention to the crypto market the federal judge is in new york the ruling today the sec is able to move forward with a lawsuit against coinbase isabel lee has the details isabel what have we got Hey, Manus, this is interesting news because it means that the SEC adequately alleged that Coinbase engaged in unregistered sale and offer securities and illegally operated as an exchange. So Coinbase is the biggest crypto platform in the U.S. It listed publicly in April 2021, so almost three years for now. And this is a blow to Coinbase and, of course, other crypto platforms who have long argued that the SEC does not hold jurisdiction among them. And, of course, this is a win for the SEC, which has asserted jurisdiction over crypto. It won several rulings in New York. And again, the ruling comes at an early stage. The judge was asked to decide whether the SEC's claims, if true, are sufficient for the case to move forward. And Coinbase, of course, still has the opportunity to defeat the case after evidence gathering and appeal. Shares are up now, seven-tenths of one percent, Manus. Isabel, thank you very much. We keep a track on Coinbase. Now, 24 hours ago, I caught up with the HSBC's Jerry Keefe on the state of U.S. markets. The U.S. market, which is kind of my, my primary of responsibility yeah. in, in, in global banking here, I think that's well covered and well understood. And that's, you know, I think it's basically go time in the markets here. Go time in the markets here. Joining me now, let's see whether he agrees. It is Mohammed Al Adri, Executive Chairman of Invest Corp. It is the Middle East's biggest alternative asset manager with 50 billion bucks on assets under management. It's expanded its headquarters from Bahrain to Beijing to right here in New York over the years. Its latest investment. It is in Terminal 6. You've all used it or possibly want to use it again at JFK. He joins me now around the desk. Good morning. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you, Wayne. So Jerry O'Keefe is, is, you know, full go on, on the USA, go time in the USA. How would you describe your, your take on the US at the moment? I think I agree. I mean, I think, uh, you know, when you look at the global economy and you see what markets are there, I think the US is the... Uh, you know, the big game uh, in, in, in town uh, is growth. We continue to see a lot of opportunities. Uh, I think uh, it continue to innovate, you know, uh, and so we are really bullish on the U.S. Uh, market. Now, you're sufficiently bullish to have already joined in on the renovation, as they say, of JFK. It's a, a, the joint venture with Crosser. Is that a bullish call on international travel? Is that a bullish call on infrastructure? Or where do you want to deploy more in the U.S. in that JV? So I think uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, a few years ago was not uh, really, uh, you know, hot. But uh, infrastructure now, I think, is really becoming uh, uh, very important. I mean, if you go around the world, you see a lot of uh, governments uh, are spending, are uh, offloading a lot of these assets because they want to... Uh, develop their infrastructure, they want to uh, build their airports, and so uh, our uh, JV with the Corsair is really in, in that uh, sense. It's uh, uh, Also, it's an asset class that investors like. It uh, uh, produces long-term uh, yield and, and good uh, returns. Obviously, we're dealing here in this country with the Francis Scott Key Bridge, the collapse, the, the tragedy around that. That's going to shine a much bigger light on infrastructure here. Sure. Do you think it will accelerate the investment case? It's tough to talk about a, a human story, but it will throw perspective on, on this infrastructure need in the United States of America. What kind of scope will that deliver for us? I mean, I think, you know, when you talk about competitiveness in this global market, infrastructure plays a really big deal. And, uh, of course, I think the U.S. is a big market for that. And, uh, you know, all the 
regulation and all the bills that uh, are uh, pushing uh, for uh, better infrastructure is uh, a great opportunity for us. And yet at the same time, you had to make a tough decision between listing. You relisted the company in Abu Dhabi on ADGM relative to here in New York. Why did you choose not to go for New York? It is, I'm told, those people that have chosen here for their IPO, it's the depth of capital, it's the breadth. What was the, what was the deciding factor for you? Well, we, uh, we listed a capital vacant in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and, and really, uh, it was two things. One is to really look at uh, one of the most dynamic markets in, in the region, and Abu Dhabi was uh, really there. It's mature, it uh, has a lot of liquidity, it attracts a lot of uh, capital flow from you know, uh, regional and uh, international players. Uh, so, uh, we, secondly, also, we really wanted to give to the uh, investors in the region uh, the ability to invest in global assets uh, publicly. And, you, you know, one of those dynamics over this year and going into next year is going to be about the flow of money, the flow of money from the pools of capital within Abu Dhabi, within Saudi, within Bahrain, outwardly. But I'm curious to get your take. We're running, counting down to a presidential election here. How do you see it playing out if Trump is re-elected for the Gulf? So, Manis, as you know, we've been doing this bridge between the Gulf uh, and the U.S. for the last 42 years. Uh, we, we bring capital, we uh, take opportunities here, we take back capital and, and uh, build platforms and uh, continue. And so, I think... Uh, we've, we've seen this happen uh, throughout crisis, throughout different, uh, you know, uh, political uh, situations, through different uh, precedents. And I really don't see how this can change. I mean, the, the, like, like we said, you know, we, we have built here great businesses in private equity and real estate and credit, and we've added infrastructure. Uh, and uh, our investors, whether in the Gulf or globally, is they, there a hesitancy by the Gulf to deploy more capital in here? It doesn't seem, I've just been with the PIF in Miami, the, the, this, this current Hamas-Israel war has not, it would appear, stymied the appetite to deploy capital. No, because I think, uh, I think people look at uh, the American economy and see a lot of uh, innovation here. They see uh, a huge uh, market uh, and we have experience in it. Uh, so tell me then, how does the, how does, I mean, there's two huge markets that, that you will have a, a finger on the pulse, private credit markets along with the IPO markets. We're constantly trying to understand whether the, the doors will open for, for IPO and exits this year. Do you think it's going to be a year of exits or trade sales? Do you think the IPO market will rejuvenate post this quarter? We, uh, I think so. I mean, uh, obviously the last uh, couple of years has been tough uh, for uh, the IPO markets, but I think you know, only the last few weeks we've seen some some are really uh, good uh, listings, whether here in the U.S. or uh, or in in Europe. In in the in the Gulf, by the way, uh, the last year, I mean, IPOs raised something over ten billion dollars for companies going up, uh, going uh, public. So I think I think we see uh, good momentum, and uh, hopefully uh, that the interest rate do come down. Uh, that will even uh, push it further. Do you think that the change in interest rates will have a, a, a significant impact on, on listings at home in the, in the GCC as well as here in the US? I think it will have, uh, it will have a good effect uh, on it, uh, obviously, because high interest rates uh, do give problems to IPOs uh, and, and the returns. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's something we really need to watch and see. I mean, I know that you've looked at sports businesses in the past. You're looking at infrastructure here in JFK. Where, where is the prime hunting ground for you now and the team? So, uh, Manus, what we did in the last few years is we have really diversified uh, the, the firm. Uh, we are now in the right asset class. We're now in the right markets. I think now we really want to concentrate on uh, building a you know, stronger private equity uh, company globally and in the U.S., uh, same with real estate, credit, uh, and infrastructure. Uh, and we see opportunities for that, and we, you know, despite what one hears of what's going on in the world, uh, we see a welcoming uh, regions uh, for business. The debate is going to be around private credit. We've written 
endless amounts of stories about it going you know, up to 1.7 trillion in assets under management. Colin Callagher has warned, UBS chair warned about you know, perhaps bubbles, et cetera. I've got Schwartzman this morning talking about default rates being so low that they're tantalizing. Give me your take on, on the default scenario and private credit and to what extent it can continue to grow. I mean, I think if you look at really what happened since the financial crisis, uh, it is, it's been all in the benefit of uh, private credit and yeah. uh, leveraged uh, loans. Uh, banks have continued to find it more and more difficult in, the, in this space, and I think it will continue to be that way. Uh, the other thing, I think both uh, you know, the credit market and the private uh, credit has, has grown. It's like you said, it's uh, quite uh, substantial. Uh, it's liquid. Uh, there are. Uh, are there any the dark clouds over private credit? I mean, it's evangelical by everybody. Are there any dark clouds in private credit at all for you, or is it just resilient? Well, well I mean, I think, I think it's a great opportunity now. Is it going to be, continue to be a great opportunity in three, four, five years' time? We, we will see. But I think there is a lot of uh, very sophisticated investors around this space, and, uh, and it continues to, to do good uh, returns. You've just launched a new climate fund. I'm, I'm curious to know the appetite for that. I mean, the, the fossil fuel industry continues uh, unabated. We had uh, the head of the PIF here recently really sort of making very strident uh, comments about the fossil fuel and the future of that. Um, but your climate fund, what's it going to focus on? So the, we, we're, we, uh, we launched this in COP, uh, as you know, in, yep. in, in Abu Dhabi. And the idea is to really raise about $750 million. Uh, uh, fund to invest in this space. And what we see uh, is that there is a gap in this. I mean, either there is a, the venture uh, capital around the climate or there is the big infrastructure uh, uh, project. But in between, there are a lot of proven uh, technologies in good companies that really need support. And it's those, those ones that we are really want to support and target and uh, grow. And let's just close off with a flyer. Why not? I know that you you, you, you were tempted by sports before. We see the Saudis, uh, you know, gorging on sport around the world. Are you, are you tempted by any aspect of sport or assets in sport? Well, we, we like sport. I mean, we, we really like the business there because obviously we see a lot of uh, good uh, growth there, but it's also great for... What do you, you know, prefer, this, this football? Do you, do you like some American sport? What, 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 do, you, what do you fancy? If well, you like we sport? look at opportunities uh, <laughs> and see what happens. But... Mohammed, thank you so much for being with us. We, we, won't, we won't get the breaking news on, on which sports team you're after. But anyway, the Executive Chairman, Mohammed Al Adi, there of InvestCorp on infrastructure investing here in the US and private credit markets. Coming up, the crypto world. We're watching Sam Bankman Fried's sentencing. We suffered a lot of damage to trust uh, in, in the end of 21 and 2022. And getting that behind us uh, is a good thing, period. Uh, I wish SBF well. A conversation next on Bloomberg. Good morning from New York. We suffered a lot of damage to trust uh, in, in the end of 21 and 2022. And getting that behind us uh, is a good thing, period. Uh, I wish SBF well. He is going to you know, serve some time and deserves to. Uh, but I think it's good for the industry to move beyond that. I think we have. I think, you know, the face of the industry in some weird way went from a, a little kid in Bermuda shorts to Larry Fink. It's the final chapter of the FTX case. Sam Bankman Fried will get sentenced to prison today for stealing billions of dollars from customers. Prosecutors are seeking the maximum of 40 to 50 years. He's back at Bloomberg. It is David Gura, and it's day one of reporting for him. So he's outside a courthouse in New York. Welcome back, David. Good to see you. Um, the worst case nice scenario to seems to be a gap between 110 years and 50, 40, 50 years. So it could be quite a brutal day of sentencing behind you. Good morning. 
Yeah, good morning. And it's it's a wide range, as you say. And our understanding is that these proceedings are now underway. Sam Bankman Fried, dressed in a tan prison jumpsuit, is in the courtroom with his counsel, his new counsel. He took on new lawyers after he was found guilty of orchestrating that massive fraud. Uh, and we've understood, our understanding is that they have gone through what's known as the pre-sentence report. That is kind of this corpus, this document that details the fraud that Sam Bankman Fried committed, some biographical information about him as well. And now they're getting down to brass tacks. And that is what kind of sentence he should face. And there is, as you would expect, a lot of disagreement among the parties about that. Um, at the core of this, and it's something that we talked about a lot on, on the Big Take podcast, is how much money was actually lost here. So in that massive fraud, investors lost money, customers lost money, and lenders lost money. There, there was this surprising development a few months back, Manus, and that is in the bankruptcy proceedings, bankruptcy lawyers said they actually feel pretty good that they're going to be able to make a lot of the folks who lost money whole again. And what the defense is saying is given that, essentially, no harm, no foul, you can't fault Sam Bankman Freed for um, this, you know, the, the entirety of this massive fraud. Prosecution saying uh, <laughs> that, that's not the way this works effectively. You can't rob Fort Knox, buy a bunch of lottery tickets, win the lottery, then say, look, we've all we've all turned out better than we did before all of this this happened. So that's really the crux of what's going to be happening today, haggling among the defense, the prosecution, the judge uh, over what that sentencing should be. And it's interesting when you look at the likes of Bernie Madoff, of course, his $20 billion Ponzi scheme sentenced in 2009 to 150 years sort of sets a precedent because this was one of the largest white collar crimes going on behind you that sentencing is taking place in. Um, it's about messaging as well to the industry, David, isn't it? It is, and we heard that explicitly from the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, Damien Williams, after this verdict was entered a, a few months back. He said that this case moved quickly on purpose. He wanted to send a message to all fraudsters, but certainly fraudsters in, in the digital assets and crypto world specifically. It's interesting, and I guess we have to wait and see sort of how resonant that message is going to be, and I think the severity of this sentence is going to determine that. But as you know well, Manus, when you look at how Bitcoin has been doing and other cryptocurrencies, uh, it's as if this didn't happen, that this was a blip. And I think that that's something that law enforcement and regulators are going to have to reckon with here in the, in the coming weeks and months, uh, just how much of a deterrent this is going to be. But it's certainly something that's being brought to bear in this sentencing memo from the prosecution. They want, yes, a, 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 a punitive side of this. They want Sam Bankman free to be punished, but they do want a message to be sent to folks in crypto, in finance broadly, that you cannot have this kind of malfeasance concoct this kind of scheme and execute it uh, and not expect to pay some sort of penalty for it. Well, if you listen to, to Brian Armstrong over at Coinbase, he talks about the ability to start a new chapter on the back of this. David, thank you very much. Great reporting. David Gura there uh, on the Sam Bankman-Free trial. Tune in for a special edition of Bloomberg Crypto. That is at 12 p.m. Eastern. And you can catch David Gura on Bloomberg's Big Take podcast. He's back in action. Uh, for some sector price action, let's get across to Simone. She's with me. Yeah, Manus, we're watching real estate stocks driving the S&P this morning. We're awaiting pending home sales data out uh, in just a few moments. Energy also among our biggest gainers in today's trading uh, as WTI rises over a percent uh, up at one point to about $83 a barrel on expectations of OPEC plus supply cuts, strong U.S. GDP uh, revisions, and of course, healthcare in there too, uh, as we see that enthusiasm over GLP ones continuing. But we're looking at communication services services uh, among the laggards today. That is not the story over the course of this quarter, though, with communication services and infotech really driving uh, some of those major games, Meta, NVIDIA among the Magnificent Seven, other growth stocks like Micron and Netflix uh, up as, as well, 40 and 24 percent respectively, uh, whereas we're seeing real estate really lagging here. I think in your battle between growth and value, it's clear the growth is winning uh, this first quarter, Manus. Simone, thank you very much. Simone Foxman there. Coming up, we'll give you market moving events, counting down to the PCE in your trading diary on Bloomberg. It's official the birds have capitulated, according to John Arthurs. These equity markets have put in five months of gains. Spoos are up 10%. We haven't seen a day 
of where we've drawn breath of a drawdown of over 2%. I want to show you the performance in the Magnificent 7 and the bifurcation of Magnificent 7. I give you NVIDIA, which is resplendent. Uh, Tesla, however, is down and Apple. These are the laggards of the Magnificent 7. And that is why people are saying we need to perhaps reconsider the construct of tech going into the latter part of the year. Maybe it is an opportunity to buy those dips. Let's stay to play on the equity markets. Your schedule, your trading diary is this. You Mitch sentiment at the top of the hour. We're also waiting for the sentencing of Sam Bankman-Fried and the U.S. bond market closes at 2 p.m. Eastern. Tomorrow, we will end the week with the U.S. PCE data and the Fed chair, Jay Powell, speaks. You've heard Waller. What will Powell push back with? Okay, that is it for uh, me and the team here. It is Good Friday tomorrow. We have a day off. We'll see you on Monday and do it all over again.